All right, well, once again, good morning and welcome to Mana Church. So grateful to be here with each and every one of you this morning. Before I jump into the message, I did want to take a moment today and just honor all of our dads and our granddads, our spiritual fathers in the room. So, Mana family, can we just make, just honor all of our fathers, grandfathers, spiritual fathers today? Man, we're so grateful for you. Thank you for what you do. When you came in today, you probably saw we got a bunch of donuts out there. We got cans of root beer because this is church people. It's root beer. So we got that available for you. We got some games outside. If anybody makes that soccer ball in that tiny little hole, you are my hero. I spent like five minutes trying to do it. Got, didn't get anywhere close. So enjoy yourself today, dads. This is for you. Hey, one more thing. Next week, you are not going to want to miss what's happening here next Sunday. We have a guy by the name of Lane Schranz who's going to be joining us. It's actually Pastor Lane Schranz. He is a pastor at one of the largest, fastest growing churches in America. In my opinion, one of the best churches in America right now. It's called Church of the Highlands based out of Birmingham, Alabama. He is going to be with us next Sunday. But get this, he's also a professional race car driver. So if you have ever heard of the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb, anybody? If you don't know what that is, a bunch of crazy people every year race cars and motorcycles and all kinds of things up that mountain as fast as they can. Well, Lane Schranz happens to be the Geico-sponsored professional race car driver who's going to be racing that thing. He's got two first-place finishes to his name. I think like five or so second-place finishes, though he'd probably hate for me to tell you that. And he is going to be racing that, so I got him to come in here on the same week to come and share with you guys on Sunday. Does that sound awesome? Anybody excited for that? It's going to be fantastic. Now, many of you know, if you were here last week, that my wife and I just got back from vacation. We went down to the beach with, with both of our families, kind of one, one, one week with my family, another week with her family. And if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook or something like that, you probably noticed that I don't post a lot of photos. And uh, two reasons for that. One of those is I'm just not very good at social media. Like, quite frankly, I don't post a whole lot. The second reason is because it is so hard with children of our age to get pictures that are actually postable. So this is what happens for us. For example, we're trying to get a nice family picture, and uh, my son is like, I got more important things to do right now, Dad, than look at this camera and smile for you. So my wife is seeing this going on. Look, notice my, my youngest son like, won't even look at the camera. Do you know how hard it is to get the attention of a seven-month-old? Like next to impossible. And so next photo for me, uh, my wife's kind of seeing it. She's asking him, hey, Joby. And he's like, I don't care. I'm just going for it. She's like, no, put your, put your hand down. And so she reaches up, next photo. And she, she gets his hand down and we think, okay, we're good. We're gonna get a photo. But now his like foot comes in front of my other son's face. <laughs> and we're smiling. My son don't care. Like, parents, this is real. This is the real world. So the next week, we were with our other family. This is my mother-in-law. Um, we, we got nine grandkids in the family so far. We got more coming, so that's going to be fun. And uh, we're trying to get nine young children all under the age of, well, most of them are under the age of four. We got a couple older ones in there together smiling at the same time. And so you'll notice, like, we're pretty close here, but Aurora, she's in the pink dress. She, she isn't quite in the picture yet. So we're waiting for her to get in the picture. My son's over here on the left. He's smiling. Next picture for me. But that didn't last. And keep going. Another picture. Yeah. It just continued. One more. Like, let me just, that's life. Like, this is what it's like to have young children. You know, when it comes to Instagram and, and, and Facebook, it's supposed to be your highlight reel. And when you have kids of this age, there just aren't very many highlights. Like, you just do what you got. You know, before my wife and I went on vacation, we talked about what we wanted this vacation to look like for us. And one of the big things that we really talked about was we didn't want to just get refreshed physically and get a little extra sleep and a little more time away, but we really wanted to get refreshed and renewed spiritually and emotionally. And so we kind of talked about what that might look like. And man, it was awesome going in there with some intentionality to this vacation and finding times just for my wife and I, sometimes with the kids, to get away and just walk down on the beach hand in hand. It's gorgeous. And just begin to pray together and begin to seek God together and ask him to do some stuff. Had a little more space to read some books to just really refresh my soul and, and my heart. And man, I got to tell you, God was so faithful during this vacation just to begin to fill me with a fresh passion. Begin to fill my heart with a fresh vision and fresh faith.
for what he's going to do. And during those two weeks, something happened. I began to dream afresh. I began to dream again for the future of our church. I began to dream again for the future of my family and the future of my own life. And this morning, the message that I want to share with you isn't like a normal Sunday morning message. It, it isn't typical, typically, like something I would typically share. It's not part of a series. It's a standalone message, but it's something that I felt like God put on my heart a while ago. And then while I was on vacation, he just spoke some things to me that I think are for you as well. You know, the summer is often a time for us to slow down, for us to unplug, for us to recharge. And I think that that is absolutely a great thing to do. I highly recommend it. But I also think that we can be intentional with that time that we have as well. So instead of just students maybe checking out for a few months before you have to go back to school, or for those of you that are going to take a vacation, instead of just vegging out for a week or whatever else you might do with some of the free time that you get this summer, to actually be intentional about recharging your relationship with God, to get some fresh vision for your life. This morning, what I want to do is I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you. And here's that challenge. I believe it's time for you to dream again. It's time to dream again. In fact, that's what I've titled this message this morning is simply dream again. And I just believe that many of you in this room have either given up on dreams that you once had or you've just stopped dreaming altogether. And I don't know why that may be. Perhaps it's because you've gone through a significant step back or a significant disappointment and it's just stolen your hope for the future. Maybe you went out on a limb to pursue a dream that was in your heart and you failed and now you're afraid to pursue any other ones because of what might happen. Maybe for some of you, life just got so busy, so repetitive, so mundane that you've gotten stuck in a rut and you've lost the motivation to try to get out of it. Or maybe for some of you this morning, you've just simply gotten burned out and you are too tired to even think about the future much less start to dream about what the future may hold. Listen, I don't know exactly where you are today, but I want to encourage you, wherever you may be, to start dreaming again. In Isaiah chapter 43, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah to the people of Israel in order to get their hopes back up from all that had gone on. They'd gone through a bunch of difficult seasons and God was trying to fill their hearts with hope again and begin to look forward to what he was about to do. I wanna to read to you out of Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19. It's in your notes, it's gonna be on the screens. You can turn there with your Bibles. And while God was speaking to the people of Israel, I believe that this is his heart for you this morning as well. Listen to this. He says, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the deserts. I believe this is God speaking to you this morning. We need to forget about some of those things that have happened in the past. We need to forget about some of those disappointments and some of those setbacks, maybe some of those failures, some of the things that have fallen by heart some of the things that have fallen apart, and we need to start to dream again because God isn't done. God isn't finished with your life. If you're sitting here breathing, then God has more in store for you. We need to start dreaming about what it would be. Now, when I use that word today, you're gonna to hear me use it many times this morning. When I use that word dream, I'm referring to more than like a dream in the night. Like I'm not referring to that crazy dream you had last night because you ate some weird pizza the night before. I'm not talking about even like a wistful daydream when you imagine yourself as an Avenger and thinking about all the cool things you would accomplish if you had those powers. Like, I'm not talking about that kind of dream. The kind of dream I'm referring to is the dream for your future. In fact, another word that you could use is vision. Getting a vision for your life. So I want to encourage you today to seek out a dream and a vision for your future. To help you with that, I want to give you three biblical ideas 
about dreams. If you're taking notes this morning, go ahead and get, get ready to write this first one in. Number one, some dreams are from God. Now, we have all kinds of dreams. Some are from God. Some are from us. We have honorable dreams. We have selfish dreams. We've got spiritual dreams. We've got fun dreams. And listen, I've got some fun dreams. Anybody ever heard of a bucket list before? Yeah, a bucket list is a list that you put together of things you want to do before you kick the bucket, things you want to do before you die. I've got a bucket list of things that I want to do. I remember when I was in high school, I always wanted to go skydiving. Like I would talk about it multiple times a year with my family. I just, wanted, I just thought, man, that's crazy. It's exciting. Get an adrenaline rush. Maybe my friends in high school would think I'm cool because I, like, I don't know, because I did it. And so I just always wanted to go skydiving. On my 18th birthday, my mom, I came downstairs and my mom was waiting for me. And she said, hey, Joe, you ready to go skydiving? And I was like, no, are you serious? And like in that moment, it got real. <laughs> and so I went, um do I really want to do this? Like, let me think about it for a second. I thought about it and went, if I back out now, like I'll never live it down. No, I'll do it. Like, let's go. Come on, mom. Let's do this thing. And so my mom drives me to this, uh, to this place that they do skydiving and I get ready. I go through this like instruction thing so I don't die like as if that's going to help if the parachute doesn't open. So uh, going through this thing and we get in the plane. Now I've talked to many people who've been skydiving before and oftentimes what I hear is they're good until they get to that moment where they're looking outside the door and at that point they go, never mind, I'm good. Well, that wasn't my case. It happened to me a little bit sooner than that. In fact, I was, I was in the airplane going up attached to this guy like, man, you're close. You ever done tandem skydiving? You're up close and personal with another human being that you've never met in your life. A little bit awkward. And so I'm like attached to this guy and I'm sitting here thinking, today could be my last day on earth. Like, if that parachute does not open, I'm done. Oh, man. So I just had a little moment with Jesus and I just repented of every sin that I could think of in the moment. I like, like if it's gonna end now, I need to make sure me and God are good. Like, let's just deal with this. That's not how that works, by the way, but that's how I was going through. And I thought to myself, you know, if I live a life worth living and yeah, I probably could have done a little bit better. Well, too late now, here we go. So by the time I got to that door, I was ready. Like, if we're gonna die, we're gonna die. Let's do this. And it was amazing. And as you can tell, I did survive. Like, praise God, we made it. So I got some fun dreams. And I got more dreams that haven't been fulfilled yet. Like my wife and I, we would love to go visit some places outside of the country for fun. Because every time we go outside the country, we go on missions trips. And it's kind of a little bit different. So we want to go visit some places for fun. Like one of, my, one of my dreams on my bucket list, you can make fun of me if you want, is I want to cook a delicious meal with only ingredients that I can find, gather, or hunt in the wild. Like that's just a bucket list item of mine. You're thinking, Joe... You're a crazy person. Well, if we ever get stranded out in the wilderness, guess who's more likely to survive? <laughs> Just saying. But I like, that's something that intrigues me. I've been working on that, you know, learning plants and different things to be able to do that. We can have fun dreams. In fact, I believe that fun dreams for our life not only bring us joy, but we can actually enjoy God through them. I believe that God wants you to have some fun dreams, some some of those dreams that we have are just plain fun. But sometimes they may not be very fulfilling. I believe that God not only wants you to have fun dreams, but I believe he wants you to have fulfilling dreams. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret this morning. The most fulfilling dreams are the ones that make a difference in somebody else's life. Those are the most fulfilling dreams. And i got to tell you, I've got even more of those dreams. In fact, those were some of the dreams that God was filling my heart afresh with at the beach over the past few weeks. Dreams for our church. Dreams for my family. Dreams for the way that God might use me one day. In Psalm 37, verse 4, it's a pretty popular psalm that people quote. I think a lot of time people don't use this quite in the way it was intended to be used. Let me read it to you. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your hearts. I think a lot of people read this verse and just assume that it means that God wants to give you things that you always wanted to have. But it's important that you understand this morning that this verse is actually a conditional statement. 
What this verse is saying is that if you delight yourself in the Lord, then God will give you the desires of your heart. Now here's what I've discovered. As I delight myself in the Lord first, that comes first. As I delight myself in the Lord, the dreams and the desires of my heart actually begin to morph into the dreams and the desires that God has for my life. And so my dreams and desires begin to reflect God's dreams and desires. So that dream that I had of marrying that one girl from high school gets replaced with even better dreams, like marrying the woman that God would lead me to. Psalm 37 goes on to say a few verses later, verse 23 and 24, that the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. I think we need to begin to ask God to fill our hearts with some God-sized dreams. Not just some little dreams, not just some fun things. Do that. Like, please do that. Have some fun. But begin to seek God for some vision for your future. Some dreams for your life. God will establish your steps. So some dreams are from God, but not all dreams are from him. Number two, if you're taking notes, some dreams are meant to be released. Sometimes the dreams that we have are obviously not from God. And when it comes to those, it's pretty easy to release them. As you follow Jesus, it becomes clear that that is clearly not a godly dream. Other times we have dreams that it's not so obvious that they're not from God. Sometimes we have dreams that we think are good dreams, dreams that will honor God, but they actually aren't from him. God has something else in mind for us entirely. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, it says, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So if God removes a dream from your life, it's because he actually has something better in mind for you. And that's hard to believe when your dream's taken away. But it doesn't make it any less true. Romans 8, 28, I'm gonna read it to you, the NIV translation, because that's the translation that I memorized it in when I was in high school. It says, and we know that in all things, somebody say all things this morning. And we know that in all things, that doesn't mean, and we know in most things, that doesn't mean, and we know in all things except for the bad things. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Here's what this means for you today. It means that God has his best for you, whether you realize it or not. And that when he asks you to release a dream to him, it's because he wants to replace it with an even better dream. And you may be in a place right now where you're saying, yeah, but Joe, I can't imagine anything better than this. Well, it's a good thing you're not God because he's got something better for you. We just have to trust him in the process. So sometimes those dreams, when we release them, God replaces them. Other times we release them and God actually returns them. Maybe you've heard of a guy named Abraham. He's found in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis and Abraham became the father of the people of Israel. In fact, God met him and he said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. At one point, God pulled Abraham aside and he said, look up at the stars of the sky and try to count them. Like, just see if you can count them. Anybody ever tried to count the stars before? Like, you got to imagine, too, when Abraham did this, there was no light pollution. Electricity was not discovered yet. No light pollution. It was dark. Like, when the night came out, you saw the stars. I hear the great sand dunes, by the way. It's on my bucket list to go, a place to go. The Great Sand Dunes is one of the best places in the U.S. to see the stars at night. So if you want to try this, go there, look up at the sky, try and count them. God says, try and count them. The problem is when you start looking and your eyes become a little more accustomed, more stars start appearing right where you're looking. You can't count them. There's too many. God says, so shall your descendants be. So shall your offspring be. So he gives Abraham this promise of this nation that he's going to come from him. The only problem was, Abraham didn't have any kids. He was getting old. He was like 75 years when the promise first came, 75 years old. He had no kids. 
In fact, he didn't have the son through whom the promise would come through until he was 100 years old. Think about that. 100 years old, finally, his wife Sarah gives birth to a son that they name Isaac. And God says, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. It's through Isaac that all these descendants will come. But then just a little bit later, the Bible says that God tested Abraham. And he said, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son to me as a burnt offering to me. Like, that's crazy. Just just think about that for a second. Abraham, as you read the story, Abraham says, okay, God, the next morning he saddles up a donkey, puts his son with him. They go up to the mountain to sacrifice. Literally, he's about to sacrifice his only son to God. Now, good thing I'm not Abraham, because if I were Abraham, I'd be thinking, um, excuse me, God, (laughs) but uh, didn't you say that uh, all my descendants were going to come from Isaac? And if I kill him, I don't know that he can have any more. Like, you see what I'm saying? I don't think he can have any kids if he's dead. Like, hold up, God. The math isn't adding up. Good thing I'm not Abraham. Abraham didn't do that. Abraham listened to God. He obeyed God. And then right as he was about to bring that knife down to kill his son, to sacrifice him to God, the angel of the Lord stopped him and said, now I see that you truly trust in me. I see that your heart is for me. Listen, God will not share even a promise he has given you with your affection for him. So if you replace your love for Jesus with your love for a promise, you're not gonna keep the promise. God was testing Abraham. He wanted to make sure that Abraham loved God first, not the promise first. You guys see this? This is powerful. God wants to make sure that our hearts are set on him and not on his promises. So we delight ourselves in the Lord first. That means that our dreams, even the ones that have been given us by, given to us by God, do not compete with God's place in our lives. So we need to be ready to let go of any dream that we may have if he asks us to. And it may be that God's just testing us in the process to return it back. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 and 19, it's a New Testament commentary on this Old Testament story. Here's what it says. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. Abraham went to that mountain ready to sacrifice his son, just believing that, God, you said that, your, that your, my descendants would come through Isaac, so even if I kill him, you're going to bring him back to life so that this promise will be fulfilled. Do you see that faith? His love for the promise didn't prevent him to being obedient to God when God asked him to release it. So some dreams are from God. Some dreams are meant to be released. Number three, some dreams are meant to become promises. And a promise goes even further than a dream. See, a promise is a dream from God that he says will happen. He speaks that to you. It will happen. When you get a promise, you can be completely confident that God will fulfill it either in your lifetime or he will use your life on earth to lay a foundation for that dream to be fulfilled in the lifetimes to come. Either way, that dream will be fulfilled. You can take that thing to the bank and cash it. If God says he's going to do it, he will do it. God will fulfill his promises. In 1 Kings chapter 8, in verse 56, I was actually in my devotional time this week when I read this, and this is where this point comes from. It came from my devotional reading. And I was reading the story. It's the story of Solomon. And Solomon is praying as they're dedicating the temple to the Lord. He's praying for the nation of Israel. And he says this. He says, blessed be the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Now watch this. Not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he spoke by Moses, his servant. Everything that God said he would do through Moses, he has done. 
Everything that we were looking forward to, everything that we were hoping for, God has fulfilled. God is faithful to fulfill his promises. And as I was reading that this week, God just began to remind me of some of the promises that he'd given me. He reminded me of some of the things that he's spoken to me over the years. And and as I began to remember those things, my heart was filled afresh with faith and with expectation because I knew that if God said it, God's going to do it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul says, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. In other words, any promise that God has given you will come to pass. There is a yes for that promise. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. If you ever wonder what that word amen means, it literally means let it be so. Let it be so. Another translation says, and all the promises of God are yes and amen. In other words, if God has given you a promise, yes, it is gonna come to pass and you can say amen. Let it be so. I am holding on to that thing. And there's really two kinds of promises. There's, number one, if you're taking notes, scriptural promises. These are promises in scripture for every single one of you. Things that God has spoken about himself things that God has said that he will do, that every single one of you in this room can claim as your own because as your own, because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That is a promise in scripture. And you may be in a difficult situation right now. Maybe you're in one of those setbacks where you've started to forget about the dreams that God has put in your heart. And I wanna remind you that even though it feels like God's there, even though you're not sure how God is allowing this, even though it feels like God is silent, he promised that he would never leave you nor forsake you. That means he's with you. Does that mean you're never gonna go through any difficulties in your life? No, that's not what that means. It means that God will never leave you when you do go through them. It means that he will always be there. Maybe some of you in this room, you're like me and you're a parent of young children and you're just finding that you need a lot of wisdom. (laughs) Like Jesus, help me. You need some wisdom and direction to raise your kids to follow him and to know him and to love him. What I love about the Bible is in James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Like, I don't know what situation you may find yourself in, but if you need some wisdom, you need some direction, just ask God. Because he has promised through his word that he will give it. Don't doubt it. Claim it. Hold on to it. It's a promise. It will be fulfilled. In Psalm 34, verse 17, it says, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. That's a good promise. You may be thinking, yeah, Joe, but I'm not righteous. Yeah, none of us are. (laughs) But Jesus was. And when Jesus went to the cross and he paid the penalty of our sin and we repented of our sin and put our faith in him, in that moment, the righteousness of Christ was given to us. So we may not be righteous in our own strength, in our own ability, but we have the righteousness of Christ. So guess what? This promise is for you. The Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. So we got promises in scripture. And by the way, that was three of like hundreds. (laughs) Like read the Bible and find some promises and start claiming them. Then we also have promises that God speaks directly to you. These are personal promises. Almost 10 years ago, in fact, as I was thinking about this story, I wanted to make sure that that I got the dates right. So I went back to one of my journals, and I found a journal entry on June 12th, 2010, almost 10 years ago, and I wrote this thing down. I was, at that season of my life, I I was doing prayer walking at night, and so every night I would come home, and and I would just take some time, and I'd go prayer walk and, and cry out to God and pray for different things. And on June 12th, I was praying for my brother. Because I was afraid in that moment, in that season of his life, I was afraid that my brother wouldn't see past 20. And I was praying for him and I was crying out to God and I said, God, would you please rescue my brother? God, would you please open his eyes and bring him in to a relationship with you? God, would you please help him to see his need for you? God, would you rescue him? And I remember in a time of praying, God just began to speak to my heart. And I just had this sense, I don't know how to explain it other than I say it this way, I had a sense within me. Like I'm kind of pointing here because it was like in here. Like in, what I would describe is in my spirit, I had a sense that my brother would become a follower of Jesus one day. And so as I was praying, crying out for God for this, I got this sense, this confidence that it was gonna happen and my prayer began to shift. 
and I started celebrating. In fact, my journal entry, I was celebrating the day that my brother would come to know Jesus, even though it hadn't happened yet. And I was thanking God for what he was going to do because in that moment, he spoke to me and said, no, it's going to happen. And I knew if God said it, God's gonna do it. And I can stand on this stage today and celebrate with all of you that a year and a half ago, my brother gave his life to Jesus at a Christian rehab center. When God says he's gonna do something, he's gonna fulfill it. Some dreams are meant to become promises. You may be thinking, Joe, how do I hear from God like that? I I want some personal promises for my own life. I think that's a fantastic question. I don't have time this morning to go through the, the process of that, but here's what you can do. If you go online to our website and you go look through our messages, there's a whole series on this. It's called Frequency. There's four messages that teach you how to hear the voice of God in your life. I wanna encourage you, if you wanna wanna learn this a little bit better, you wanna walk in this, go online, listen to those messages. So listen, I wanna both encourage and challenge you this morning. It's time to dream again. Dream about fun things. Make a bucket list. Put some things on there that you've always wanted to do. You'd be amazed at what God can do. You may think, Joe, it's impossible for this to happen. Put it on the list. (laughs) There's nothing God can't do. But don't just stop there. Dream about some fulfilling dreams that make a difference in the world around you. Begin to ask God to give you vision for your life. Ask God to reveal that purpose that he has for you to accomplish and fulfill in your lifetime. I don't think I've ever actually as far as I can remember, maybe I have, but I don't think I've ever actually given you homework from the stage before, but today I'm going to do it. <laughs> and I think if you actually do it, if you take it seriously and actually do it, one day you're going to thank me for it. And here's my homework for you. Number one, set aside time this week to dream again. And I know many of you are just crazy busy, so put it on the calendar. <laughs> like give up Netflix for a night. And start to dream again. And number two, write those dreams down. Don't just think about them once and think, oh, that was kind of cool and forget about it. Write them down. Pray over those things. Ask God to begin to do things that you don't think is possible. Make the bucket list. I want to leave you with Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. This is Paul talking about God. It says, now to him, this is God, now to him, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Dream big dreams. Think big dreams because we serve a God who is able to do far more abundantly than we can even think, than we've even asked for. Dream big. It says verse 21, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. Big God dreams glorify God. I believe that he wants you to start dreaming again. He can do so much more than you ever thought possible. I'm gonna finish with this prayer that I found this week. I actually wanna read it to you. It's gonna be on the screen too so you can follow along. It's, It's just a power-packed prayer. Here's what it says. It says, disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrived safely because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord. When with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery. We're losing sight of land. We shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push us into the future in strength, in courage, hope, 
and love. Disturb us, Lord. Let me pray for you this morning. God, would you disturb us today? Lord, would you disturb us to begin to dream more boldly? God, for some of us in the room, would you disturb us to start dreaming again? To believe that you are working in our lives. To believe that you have more for us than what we're currently experiencing. God, would you give us hope for the future that you have for us? God, I pray that you would wipe away any fear, any disappointment, any hindrance to prevent us from dreaming again. And fill our hearts this week, God, with God-sized dreams, with vision for the future. In the name of Jesus. If you do me a favor and keep your heads bowed.